And um, I should be able to find my slides here, such as they are. And we're going to need the 64-bit virtual machine. So let me bring that up. I went and got the 2016.2 64-bit virtual machine. Uh, that's the one I recommend. Um, older versions are fine. Just whatever you do, don't run updates online. Um, because as we know, the online updates get you to the latest version of GCC that is total garbage and files up all our projects. It even files up the 123 projects. The new version of GCC not only compiles into things you can't hack properly, it also compiles into things that just don't work. If you make a simple program that reads 10 characters from the input and then prints out 10 characters, it crashes to the seg fault. Are so, you using the new C++ compiler? Uh, well, I can't prove that. I was going to report it to GCC and I went to their website and they said, we don't want to hear stupid reports like this. All we want is for you to compile it yourself, tell us every switch in your compiling, every library it connects to, what, it, what version of Linux you're on, because obviously they've got a chip on their shoulder about it being something else. So I don't know it's GCC. All I know is if you update Kali, it doesn't work. It could be some library GCC uses. There's some environment variable in Kali or something like that. Anyway, um, so let's talk a bit about the theory of 64-bit and then just do some demos and just there's some projects you can do about it. So 64-bit assembler is only a little different than 32-bit assembly, but the differences can get you. In the first place, you have a lot more registers. You have 16 registers, um, and in f and this is a vast improvement over 32-bit, where there really are not enough registers, and you waste a lot of time putting something in the register, using it, putting it back in memory so you can empty up the register to put the next thing in the register, especially when you're calling functions. That makes a significant difference. And they all have to have new names, of course. Now, we originally had A, and then we had AX, and then we had EAX, and we could have had EEAX, but they decided to just go to R for 64-bit. Um, there are 128-bit processors, but I don't aware of any fully 128-bit processors. There are processors that have some instructions that move 128 bits and some move only 64 bits. The motion from 64 to 128 has not been uh, fast. Nobody seems to care. Anyway, so this is the new hotness, 64-bit. It is pretty much a lie. Um, however, I should mention, now you have all these versions. Like you've got R15, and then you've got R15D for 32 bits of it, and R15W for 16 bits of it, and R15B for 8 bits of it. Of course, you can refer to portions of the register. <coughs> so you can do math at other scales. Um, and that is something that normal people wouldn't do much, but of course we would do if we were writing shell code to get rid of all those nasty zeros in the higher order bits. Anyway, um, however, nobody actually implements all the 64 bits. It's pretty rude. They don't, because 64 bits of addressing takes you, see, 32 bits is 4 billion. And that's why the maximum amount of RAM you can address in a 32 bit processor is 4 gigabytes. And you can implement paging or something to flip between pages and create the illusion of mapping more, but you can't directly map more than 4 gigabytes. But 64 bits can map 16 billion gigabytes. So it's an enormous number far more than you really need, so Windows doesn't bother to implement it all. They, and I, they do 64-bit operations on, on numbers you put in, but they don't map memory with a 64-bit address. Windows just uses 44 bits or 48 bits, depending on what version you have. <coughs> and strangely enough, they don't even make it contiguous. If you really had 64-bit addressing, you'd have the situation on the right where you got from 0 going up to 7, FFFFFFF, and all the way up to F, 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 and that would be the first half and the second half. But for some reason, the way they do it is in Windows is if you have 48-bit addressing, you take uh, 47 bits worth of it with the starting with zero and the other 47 bits of worth of it starting with Fs. So you have two completely separated blocks of memory. This is convenient for us because the stack is up there and so there aren't any zeros. Leading zeros in the bit of bytes we want to inject, so we can inject strings and take over the machine. I kind of doubt that was their design goal. But anyway, this, the only addresses you will see are huge, very small ones and very large ones. The, the area in the middle is not actually accessible by the computer. Yeah? Can you, can you explain why that it would be better for us? Oh, it's better for us because if you have, uh, this is what been happening to everybody who updated their Kali. Uh, if you update your Kali, then the compiler compiles position-independent executables, so all the addresses start with all zeros, so you can't refer to any address without injecting like four bytes of zero. 
and therefore you can't put it in a string variable because of zero terminates the string. And um, another thing it does, even if you go to position independent executables, it frequently starts everything at 800,000. So it's 8080000000. And again, you can't do anything. Whereas the older version of GCC that I wrote the projects with start with 0804. Right. So you don't have a null byte. Because you can't have a null byte anywhere in the code you inject. And the code you inject typically has to have addresses in it. So but it would be a um, security measure to move your code to some location and all start to zeros, and that might be what pies do. Uh, exploding pies should be another brave new world to look into. Position independent executables appear to start at zero, but they're actually somewhere else. So I'm thinking a lot of the techniques here would not work, but maybe there's some way to change them and make them work. Anyway, but you can inject one zero. It has to be the last byte you want you eject. So there are a few cases where one zero isn't the end of the world, but you can't have more than one zero in a row unless you're injecting something other than a string variable. Anyway, so um, syscall is the thing that replaces int 80. And syscall is how you make a call to the operating system like the kernel or uh, typically the kernel, but I think it can be other parts of uh, the C libraries. So uh, you do not have to put data on the stack to call syscall anymore. What you do is you put it in the registers and there is a strange order, RDI, RSI, RX, RDX, R10, R8, R9, in that order. You can pass six parameters and the number of the system call is an RAX. So there are actually seven registers used to pass information in. And of course, sometimes, like in a print, you're gonna print a whole string, so one of those is in fact a pointer to the string and the string is probably on the stack, just as a handy place to put it. But uh, the syscall does not directly look on the stack. It only looks at the contents of those registers, and if they're pointers, it'll look for where those registers point. So you can just look these syscalls up. Uh, there's a link on L7H on my page that gets you here. So here's some examples. Syscall 0 is read, write. Syscall 1 is this is sysread, this is syswrite, and on it goes. And you have some condensed information here about how to call it, telling you this one here, syswrite uses RDI and RSI and RDX for um, some kind of pointer, the pointer to a user buffer and the size of the buffer. So this will print a certain number of points. And we'll, we'll do a couple of these simple ones here as we go ahead. Um, there is a, um, if you want more details about the registers, we are, of course, remember there's some more exotic registers, like the flags and stuff. You can find out about them at this link. There are whole bunches more of other registers on the side, not used that often, for things like floating point operations. I came across these in one of the CTFs. There was a uh, buffer overflow with a canary value stuck in the floating point registers. I didn't even know they existed, but I had to figure it out. They'd, the first thing you do is stick something in there, then it would call a subroutine, and then if that value was not the same, it would crash instead of letting you come out. So you had to figure out what it was, fetch it out of there, restore the canary value, or you could not overflow the stack and take over the program. So anyway, um, here's, so there are opcodes, of course, and 64-bit opcodes are not necessarily the same. Operations are not the same as 32-bit. Here are all the moves. Oh, oh here, these aren't all the opcodes. These are general categories, like move, a conditional move, exchange, byte swap, stack usage, push and pop, and so on. There are many of these things. They're pretty much the same as they were in 32-bit, but there are a few uh, differences. Not too bad in the opcodes. Um, You've got shift right and shift left and all the usual stuff. Um, so here is the syscall that does right. So you put one in RAX, that tells it that you're calling the right syscall, and now you've got other parameters to set. You set RDI to one, that is where to write. One is the um, handle to standard out. So this will write to the console. If you had a file or a network connection, you can be writing to them too. You push the string onto the stack, then you put RSI into R, in RSP. The RSP is the stack pointer. Remember, it's ESP in 32 bits, and it's RSP in 64 bits. You put it in RSI because the RSI is the pointer to the buffer containing the data to print. So we are putting the string on the stack, but we have to tell it that it's on the stack. It's not going to assume that. Then you said RDX to the link to the string, and then you call syscall. So we pass three parameters in that order. RX, RDI, well, Four parameters, RX to one, if you want to call it that, but they don't usually think of that as a parameter, that's determining a syscall, and then RDI, RASI, and RDX, and then you call it. So it's not much more difficult than the uh, int 80s we were doing, but it is a little different. 
So let's start making some assembly programs. You can write assembly directly. Um, we've done a little bit of this before. Here is a very simple assembly program. You can def you define a start, a global label called start, and then you define it here with, with underscore start colon. So that is the entry point, like main in C. And then you just put in assembly code. You can put a semicolon here explaining what they do, which is certainly good when you're starting out. So this is going to move an immediate value to RIX. Notice how long the value is. It's eight bytes long. Everything is 64 bits. That's eight bytes. So this is ASCII, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, yeah. So that puts it in RAX. Then you push it on the stack. So that's the string to be printed. Now you put um, RAX to one to tell it I'm going to do a write. RDI to one to say I want to write to device one, which is standard out. You put the stack pointer in RSI. That's the uh, address to the thing to print. And you put eight in because I'm going to print eight bytes. One register has eight bytes, and eight, eight ASCII bytes is eight things to print. So when you run that assembly code, you can now when you compile it, you can compile it with YASM. Uh, there was something called uh, NASM, I think, and the latest version is YASM. Uh, you could just app get install it in Kali, in the modern 64-bit Kali. So you assemble it to 64-bit Linux. Uh, code, that's ELF, ELF is the format, executable link format, that is the equivalent of PE in Windows. All executable, Windows, all Linux executable rules are ELFs, Windows executables are PEs. So this is 64-bit ELF, we're going to take this assembly code and turn it into object code in this format. Now you have to link it, connecting it to libraries and such. Even if you aren't using libraries, you do have to go through a linker, it's LD, so we'll take the, put the output here and take object code as input. So this will load it in memory and connect it to whatever else has to be connected to to make a complete executable in this file name, which I called abc1.out. And then you can just do dot slash abc1.out to run it, and you will see it prints the letters backwards and then crashes. Because I didn't do any exit, zero. I didn't do any return. It just executed these instructions and then continues to process whatever happen junk happens to be in memory as if there were more instructions there. So this is very sloppy stuff. So let me go uh, look at my virtual machine. Let's do some of these. Also, did you get a free null byte? A free null byte? Because your string doesn't end with a null. It doesn't, but I don't need it to because you tell it the length. Oh, you tell it the length. Yeah, this print is, this is actually, this is not uh, C's print. This is print NF. Right. Yeah, that's, that, no, I had the same feeling at first. So um, I've got them all here. If I nano ABC one dot asm there it is um, and my nano colors parts of it which is not necessarily helpful but anyway um, so if you run it it's abc1 um, dot out i don't know why i called it dot out but i did okay so that does that and then a segmentation fault because it doesn't return so we have to add an exit so that's in the next one abc2 um, so this is exactly the same except for the last two lines. And the last two lines, just put 3C in RAX and then do a syscall. 3C is exit. And this one has no parameters. So now, instead of just continuing to attempt to execute whatever junk happens to be in RAM, it will exit back to the operating system cleanly. And so if you run that one, um, it prints the eight bytes and doesn't crash. So that's, this is what the latest GCC cannot do. At the end of main, it crashes instead of returning back. Anyway, um, all right, you may have noticed that the bytes are backwards. That's kind of rude. Now, there are various solutions. You could um, make something that moves the bytes around, or you could just be incredibly wimpy and just put them in backwards in the first place so that when it reverses them, they'll be right side, and that's what I did here. Just put 41, 42, 43, 44, just the way we're used to in debuggers. That's the way you put strings if you want them to come out right. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. So ABC3 out, um, uh, what did I do? Perhaps I didn't compile that one. Looks like I need to compile that one, it's just as well. All right, so let's compile that one, it's um, YASM. Okay, and it's ABC3, uh, three that is. All right, that will make object code. So if I do LS now, I now have an ABC3, uh, Somewhere. Yeah, an ABC3 on ASM 
and ABC is like, oh, you can't execute object code, but it is binary machine code, it, but it needs to be linked in, and you do that with the LN, or LD, I think. There it is. So I'm going to take the ABC object code, and I'm going to put it in a file called abc3.out. All right. And now I can execute that, and that prints them in order, and then doesn't crash. Now I don't have a carriage return at the end. That's a character 10. I'd have to print more than eight bytes, or I'd have to replace the H with the 10 or something if I wanted to do that. Uh, I wonder if we can do that. Let me, anyway, we'll get there. All right, so now, um, so we've been here, and you'll be doing this all in the project. So there's the letters in order. Now, the next, we might try storing a string somewhere. Right now we just have one byte, put literally in a register. So we're really limited to just eight bytes. And that's kind of sloppy. So now we ought to move up to the glory of having a string variable. And you do that by having a data section. Now I got a data section and a text section on this one. And the data section now has a string. DB is defined byte. There are different kinds of variable types. There aren't very many of them. But these are byte variables, which is short integers, one byte each. So I define byte and the quote to tell it I want all that hello world followed by a byte of 10, which is a character term. So that is five for hello, five for world, one for the space, one for the screamer, and one more. That's 13 bytes total. So when you print it, um, you've got to put RDX of 0XD, which is 13 bytes. And then you do a syscall to print, going out to the descriptor of one, and then you exit. So it's just a very small variation on the previous one, just to add that text. So this one, um, you can look at it with obj dump to see what it is, and it'll tell you it's, it's ELF64, uh, and it'll tell you it's start address. Notice it's start address is all full of zeros, the kind of thing that would really be a drag if you were to jump into code down there. And here's the symbol table, which comes out from object dump. Uh, you have a text section and a data section. The text section starts here at 400,000, which is the same place that Windows thinks all their programs are. The data section starts at 600,000, and then you have other sections down here. A lot of labeled things like start and the BSS start and the end, which are put in by the compiler for the linkage between the operating system and entering the program. The start is where the place we write starts. And you may remember this in Ida Pro. If you, you execute Ida Pro on a program, you often find yourself in the start stuff that the compiler put there that doesn't seem to go anywhere. There are a couple of prolog functions that you didn't write that don't contain the code you're trying to debug and you have to sort of hunt around to get down to the real stuff. Anyway, um, if you use GDB on this program and run it and put in a breakpoint to freeze it uh, so that it doesn't, it has to be during execution in order to see the memory map, you can then do info prop mapping and you will see the two sections are here, the 400,000 and 600,000. Uh, GDB is rude and does not label them text and data. I don't know why. It could, but it doesn't tell you. But you can see where the stack is down here. I don't think this one has a heap, but there's the stack. And like I mentioned, the stack is way up here. So that's pretty handy. Uh, all right. I'm kind of worried about the zeros on the left there. But we can, in fact, execute. Uh, we will be able to do 64-bit exploits. All right. So there's the text and data sections. If you examine them in GDB, the text section starts at 400,000 and contains executable code. So you can examine it with seven instructions with an I. The data section, you can examine with X if you want to see it in hexadecimal, or C if you want to see it in ASCII. And so here it is spelling out H-E-L-L-O, hello world, followed by the 10, followed by random jump that's left over. S-Y-M-T-A, I don't know what that stuff is. All right, so that's what they look like. And if you do info registers in 64 bits, you get this ugly mess because there are a lot of registers. Um, you've got our, the relative base pointer there and the relative stack pointer there. You've got the instruction pointer here pointing to start. And you've got section pointers down here, just like before, FS and GS on memory sections. You don't use them too often, but we will use them a little bit when we get to exploiting uh, interrupt handlers. And uh, you have all these others, A, B, C, D, and then they run out of letters and just use 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, up to 15 to have enough stacks. And those are the general purpose 64-bit registers that can be used for anything. And in this program, we're not using them at all. So that's the game. Um, and now we can try reading stuff. 
So you have a, uh, define a data section, and I just fill it with random data just to make enough room. So I reserve enough space for 10 characters. So I have four A's, four B's, two C's, and an X. So I can have 10 characters and another one at the end for like a line feed or a, a zero or something you want to put there. So now I specify, I do a syscall to do a read. And the read is zero. Zero is read, one is write. So now it's very much like a write. You have, um, you specify how many lengths of bytes to read and you specify a pointer to where you want to put it. So I'm going to put it on that string in the data section, not necessarily on the stack. I'm going to reserve a space in the data section that's big enough to put it. I'm going to point to it here. And when I do this syscall, it's going to read from standard input characters up to that limit. And standard in has a file descriptor of zero. So that's this, all this is the stuff. This is essentially the C function CN to take characters and put them in a variable, although it's CN with a length limit, so you won't have a buffer overflow. So this will read up to 10 characters from the user um, and put it up on that variable. And this will then print it out. Just print out the same 10 characters so we can see what it got. And this will then exit. So it's very small variation from what we've done. And that is what I called read.asm. So let's take a look at that one because it doesn't do what you might think it would do. So let's make sure I've got it right, read. Dot ASM. So I've defined space here with 11 ABs, 4 A's, 4 B's, T's, and an X. I've specified to read 10 characters and put it on that string variable. You don't have to have hexadecimal addresses. This string one is interpreted as a label you defined, which is a small bit of convenience you get from assembler. It's slightly bigger than machine language. Down here I just print 10 characters and exit. So that's read dot out. Okay, when I do that, I can put in hello, and what I get back is hello followed by carriage return bbcc. Um, because what I typed in was hello and then I hit carriage return. So it actually took six bytes and put them here, including the carriage return, but it printed out 10 bytes, which is the next four here. It didn't print the X at the end because I didn't put in an L terminator. And I I suppose I could figure out how to put in an L terminator for the command line, but I think I'd need to have like a Python script to do it. Anyway, um, so that's what it does. And it should not have a buffer overflow or anything. If I try putting in too much, it doesn't complain. It takes the first 10 characters, and the rest is just sitting in the buffer, so it interprets them as the bash command after the program exits. All right, so that's cool. All right. So you see junk at the end. So now we can do a seizure cipher. So here's the game. I'm going to take reserve space for eight characters. I'm just going to do eight characters with the Caesar cipher. The Caesar cipher is just where you move everything in the alphabet. I'm just going to move everything forward one letter. So A becomes B and B becomes C. Now a proper Caesar cipher loops around so Z becomes A. And I'm going to just not worry about that and let it run off the end into ASCII punctuation marks or something because I just don't care about the details. Um, so I'm going to start here. I'm going to have a pointer to the string in RSI. And this is going to make a system call, which is going to read. Um, it's going to read eight bytes from the user, and it's going to encrypt it with the seizure cipher. So it's going to take those eight bytes and put it on top of those A's and B's, just the way we did, because the pointer is string one, which points up to string one. Then it's going to set RBX to point to the string, and here it's just going to add 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 to it, which means, by the way, something sort of nuts. If one of those bytes were, for example, FF, then this would roll over and add two to the next one. So this is a pretty sloppy Caesar cipher. This is like, this is what sloppy programs do. They do the right, this is what Microsoft recommended. This is what Microsoft's official rule was until 2002. They said, don't bother worrying about any edge cases that don't make any sense. Just assume that you have honest users trying to put in reasonable input and get the job done. So you can handle normal typos, but don't worry about nonsense like null bytes and FFs and things like that that are not part of normal business. Because we don't need to worry about hackers. So that's the point. This is the simplest way. So I'm just going to add this 64-bit constant to that and then take RCX and put it in the location pointed to by RBX, which is going to put it on top of that string and then just print out the string. Okay, so that should be a seizure cipher. So let's play with this one, seizure.asm. Um, now, just take a look at it and make sure it looks good. All right, there it is. Reserving the space, here it is adding that 64-bit 0101 to it. That's the game. So the first thing I have to do is compile it. 
but he has them. So it's going to be Caesar. All right. Now, when I compile it, I get an error message. Value does not fit in 32-bit field. And it might not be obvious what that means. We'll just carry on. It's only a warning, right? It didn't stop it. So we'll just pretend that doesn't matter and keep going and see what happens. Um, so now we're going to link the Caesar. And it's going to be Caesar.out. All right. So now I can run Caesar.out. Okay, and I can put in hello, and I get the H goes to I, the E goes to F, the L goes to M, and the O doesn't change. So now I might wonder why that happened. So it would be worth looking at the assembly, at the machine code that was created by this thing. And I think I can do it with, uh, say, GDB, probably various ways to do it. Let me try this, and I'll go back to my notes if I get confused. Caesar.out, we can run this thing in GDB. Now, I can um, probably just disassemble, start, right? Yeah, because it's not main, it's start. And so here's the machine code. And notice, uh, it should resemble the assembler I had. So up here, I put some stuff in RDX. There's the zero going in there. There's that 6001C in the other section. That's where the string variables are in the data section. So this is fine. Then I do a syscall. That's what read the data from the user, and the data did go in all right. But here's the XOR, add one, it's only 32-bit add. One, zero, one, zero, one, not a 64-bit add. Now, why did that happen? It totally did not obey its instructions. There's a gruesome reason. Um, all right, uh, object dump is another way to see that it's a 32-bit add, not a 64-bit add, which is what that warning message said. So you go to the Intel Software Developers Manual that tells you what the 64-bit machine code processor exists. These are all the ads that exist. There really aren't that many. And notice that they don't do 64 bits. 8, 16, 32, there's only two ads available to add 64-bit values. You can add registry or memory to a register, and you can add a register to register or memory. You, there's no way to add an immediate value. The immediate value is what I tried. There is no 64-bit add with an immediate value. This is back to the stuff that was not supposed to happen to us in 64-bit language. You are back to having to do convoluted things because the command you want doesn't exist. So you can't add an immediate 64-bit value. You have to put an immediate 64-bit value in a register and then add the register. And that's what you get in machine code. With all the operations they give you, you very frequently do not have the one you need and you have to work around it. So there made Caesar 2 dot assemble. Okay, this looks the same. The only difference is down here where I'm adding, I take uh, the 01001 and I put it in R8 and then I add R8 to RCX. That's the only difference. But those two will actually do what I tell them to instead of trying to use an instruction that's not there. So all I have to do is compile Caesar 2, which would be Yasm, Caesar 2. And now it doesn't complain warning me that something that I asked to be 64-bit is in fact 32-bit. And now I LD it to put it together. And now my glorious Caesar 2 dot out can take hello and the O goes to a P. So it can now do eight whole bytes. Yeah? What were you saying before about entering FF? Why is it a problem? Well, because if I have FF, it will add one to that, causing it to go to zero, zero, and one will go to the next higher bit. It will roll over. So um, take a look at this one right here. There. You can see it in the 32 bit one. When I add 0101 to RCX, if the last byte of RCX is FF, it will change to 00, zero uh, and it'll have one roll over and it'll add two to the next one, not one. One there plus the one that rolled over. So this Caesar cipher is kind of messed up. There are cases in which it does not move anything forward with one letter. Yeah, because you didn't. You didn't account for the rollover at the end. Right. So that's why real programming, this is what all the bugs we exploit are, you have to think of everything like that and put in an if statement to check for everything when things are zero, when things are too big, when things are too small, when things are too big to fit in your numerical variables and they roll over and become negative. You know, that's what leads to all the bugs we exploit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very hard to do and we're not doing it at all here. I would just... They just wanted me to, they wanted to hire me to teach Python to people at a business school. And I warned them, you know, I teach really bad coding. 
The real coding is like doing your taxes. It's every little detail, hours and hours of what if this is zero, what if this is null, what if this is all these case statements, and that's really boring. I don't touch it. I only do like what the technical dignified term for the this crap is rapid prototype. <laughs> Making something that will kind of work enough to see how we, if we like it, and then we'll hire a real programmer to like slave away in a cubicle to get every little exception removed from it. <laughs> it's more fun. Anyway, all right. So you got to use a register. And now it works uh, in that you can have up to eight bytes of stuff that will move forward in the alphabet. All right. So now I just gave you some challenges to do for extra credit. So you just got homework to do. This is, there's no eye clickers, but you got projects to do some of this stuff. So we're here in 127, and yes, okay. So this one is, the stuff I just showed you was 64-bit, um, this one here, 64-bit assembler. Then there's a buffer overflow in 64-bit using this stuff, the usual way. This is exactly the same as your Linux buffer overflow way back here, only 64 bits. Um, but here's 64-bit assembler, you just do those things up to the Caesar cipher and get them working, and for extra credit, you can do some slightly different things in assembler. This one here is change hello to hello from your name. So you have to make the thing longer and have it print out your name without crashing. So that's a very simple, small variation of what happened before. Um, then you've got another Caesar. Let's make another Caesar that can read eight bytes of text and move each one backward by three in the alphabet instead of forward by one, so that's not too bad. And like I say, it's okay if you get strange results for like A, B, and C, and null and all that, let's not worry about that in assembler. But get it working so that it can move things backwards and when you put in hello, it will turn it into ebil. Because it's E, F, G, H, B, C, D, E, and so on. And then it will have junk here as the carriage is turning and other bytes are turned into God knows what out there. Um, then you might as well do XOR. Uh, read in up to eight bytes of text and XOR it with the key of dog. Now. Uh, XOR with a single byte is something people sometimes use to obfuscate malware. It's incredibly easy to break, of course, because there's only 256 possible keys. So XOR with longer keys is better. Real encryption routines like um, AES have XOR as the main engine that actually scrambles things, and they have a key schedule that creates zero random bytes to XOR with the stream. Um, that's how um, RC4 works. And e, uh, all encryption routines, XOR is one part of the step. Rolling things left, rolling things right, XOR, matrix multiplication. There's really only four or five mathematical operations, and it's these various operations combined in a series that make encryption. So it's good to know this one. And so when you when you get it right, CNET 127 lowercase turns into this mess. But one thing about XOR is it tends to create unprintable characters. So it is, if you just take capital letters to XOR with other capital letters, you get carriage returns and special keys that turn things into Japanese and garbage like that. So anyway, um, chain, I chose this little turn into that junk so it's at least readable so you know when you've got it right. And if you if you have a multi-byte key, what that means is um, you use the first byte on D, next on O, next on it. So you could interpret it as an eight-byte key of dog, dog, do. That's the same thing as a dog key. Since we're only gonna do eight bytes to make it easy so we can just load the stuff in the register and go. Anyway, that's the game. Um, you should be able to do those things with these procedures, and then you can go on and do this overflow, which I think I'll talk about next time. Um, are there any questions about anything? Well, let me stop the recording and hand it over to Duffy. Let's see what he got with his uh, doodad. This is uh, 127, Chapter 7.